Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Chad Radford, and I am an editor and music writer here in Atlanta, Georgia. Tonight, I'm teamed up with Acapella Books, an independently owned bookstore with more than 30 years of history here in the city. We're talking with award-winning journalist and author of The Life and Times of Malcolm McLaren, Paul Gorman. Paul, how are you, sir? I'm fine. How are you? Doing very well. Very Good. well. Happy to be talking with you. Yeah, it's great to be, great to be here. So Malcolm McLaren is one of the most misunderstood impresarios of uh, the 20th century, and we'll be discussing his life and work as it is presented in the book. Uh, but for those of you who have ordered a book, your copy with a signed book plate, book plate will be arriving soon. And if you'd like to order, just head over to acapellabooks.com after the conversation tonight. Uh, we'll have about 15 minutes to take some questions from the audience uh, here in just a little bit. So be sure to leave your questions in the Q&A field that you see on your screen, not in the chat field. And if you post your questions in the chat field, we won't see them and we do want to hear from you. So uh, with that, we'll jump right in. And um, so I guess, you know, the first thing that comes to mind is uh, that here in the States, Malcolm McLaren is thought of mostly as kind of a shadowy character who invented slash manage the Sex Pistols. But as it turns out, that's just one chapter in a very remarkable lifetime. And uh, I guess I wanted to use that to ask you, who, who was Malcolm McLaren and why did you want to tell his story in this nearly 900 page uh, <laughs> Well, I think the, you know, that's, a, that's a good question which I'm still struggling to answer in a way because I think I set out knowing that he was more than the public image of him conveyed. Um, and so in a way, the idea of the book was to find out who he was. And as I wrote it, um, put it together and researched it over, I think about six or seven years in all. I was working on other projects as well, but it was constantly at the back of my mind, I was kind of formulating ideas about him. I found that, you know, he was, um, he was kind of ever expanding in terms of his activities and his engagement with, I think, three or four key areas. One of which was art, visual art. Um, the other of which was design, fashion design, but also interiors. The third of which was politics. He was a political creature. And in fact, only yesterday I was contacted by. Um, somebody who went to art school with him in the 60s, who talks about, who told me about, this is a guy who now lives in Mexico. Uh, I couldn't track it down. I'd not actually heard of him before. And he told me how McLeod politicized him when he was 22. <laughs> and this is in the late 80s. And so there was also a political edge to what he did, whether it's with a, a, a big or small P. And I think the third thing is, the fourth thing is media. He was very interested in communication and media and maybe sometimes subverting it. So I think if you look at those areas, and he's a slippery character because he jumps between them all the time. Music is there, fashion is there, politics, media. Uh, that's where you find him. But you find him ever-changing, really. You know, they talk about, you know, David Bowie is the chameleon of rock and th those kind of guys. Really, McLaren was uh, quite an evasive character to pin down. And that's the kind of person I like to write about. Very nice. <laughs> How much time did you spend researching and writing this book? And what lessons did you learn from having gone through the process when you were writing the story of the face and reasons to be cheerful, the life and work of Barney Bubbles? Well, it was the same approach, really. And I think the, it's only after uh, going through these uh, adventures and exercises, I really realized that these, these subjects, people, are interesting to me. And I want to make sure that other people see what is interesting about them. So I want to dismantle some of the received opinion about them. Say, for example, the Face magazine was just a style bible. That's what they used to call it. Uh, you know, it was all, all surface. Whereas in, in fact, it was really reflecting what was going on in pop culture and quite often driving it through the 80s and 90s. And the same time with McLaren, I wanted to show how he fast-tracked really interesting 
and avant-garde, vanguard ideas straight into the mainstream. You know, for example, when he really did not create the Sex Pistols, but he gave them the name, he gave them a platform in which they could work together and come together as the great band that we know. But he wasn't interested in signing them to an indie label. He wasn't interested in being them being outsiders, really. He signed them to EMI, the biggest record company in the UK at the time, and then Warner Brothers, one of the biggest record companies in America, because he wanted them to kind of play and disrupt and cavort right in the mainstream, right in the public eye. And so um, I really learned about the ways in which he did that. He's a very wily person and very considered. Quite often people think of him as glib, you know, this caricature of him being this Machiavellian puppet master. Right. Actually, he spent eight years at various art schools understanding the history of art and actually becoming a visual artist. Mm -hmm. And then at the same time, he absorbed a lot of the radical thinking around political art, political groups like the Situationists. And then he applied that to the Sex Pistols in that case. But he also applied it to uh, the situation when he ran for Mayor of London in 2000. Wherever you see him, he, he was trying to apply it when he was a Hollywood producer in the 80s. So um, he was a very strategic person. And I don't think that that was really uh, uh, acknowledged. Right. Uh, so two, two questions to kind of follow up there. So like the time, how much time did you spend researching this book? Did this take years of your life? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> kind of, you know, it was the ever evolving thing that ate up my life. I, I suppose I really started thinking about it on his death in April, 2010. Okay. I talked to him previously about working with him on a project which was about art and authenticity because I thought he'd mm -hmm. be an interesting person. He also contributed to my first book, The Look, which is about music and fashion. Um, right. And um, he told me that he'd signed to write his autobiography, uh, but he found himself caught up in this thing where he just kind of processed this information, whether it's his dysfunctional background, being brought up by his grandmother, these tour around the art schools, the escapades with the Sex Pistols. They kind of became sort of enough objectivity. And of course, I offered to write it at the time, but really, you know, he said that, you know, he wanted to write his own book, and quite rightly as well. The thing is that uh, when he tried to wriggle out of the contract, his um, agent, Ed Victor, now sadly passed as well, said to him, Malcolm, you, you've either got to write the book or write a check, which meant that he had to give the advance back, which was quite a lot of money. And so he was constantly trying to find a way to write a book. So that's a long answer to when he died, it occurred to me, not in an ambulance chasing way, but it began to occur to me over a period of months that actually I had access to certain of his thoughts and also certain of his papers through the estate as well, where I thought, well, you know, damn it, I can give this a pretty good go, but it's going to take a long time. And my mm -hmm. long suffering publisher really stuck with me through those seven years of whizzing through deadlines. <laughs> and God bless him. Yeah. <laughs> uh, the, you know, the other question that I'd sort of, and that brings up yet another question, but I kind of wanted to talk with you about just the, the concept of money when it comes to McLaren. You know, in the book, it, there, there's, a, there's a passage in there where he's described as have, being able to look at his own work with indifference. Mm. Uh, and, and, and I sort of wondered if that was kind of the same, same way he approached money with his endeavors. It didn't seem like, it seemed like he did what he wanted to do and, and it sort of naturally was successful on its own terms uh, a lot of the times. Yeah. You know, I, I don't think he, was, I really, this is going to sound odd, but I don't think he was actually interested in money in, in, right. in the end. I think he was, he was interested in the impact it had with him calling himself the embezzler in the great rock and roll swindle. <laughs> he always said afterwards or later in life, it was a joke, you know, an embezzler doesn't call themselves the embezzler they, if they embezzle. Um, and, you know, if you think about it, when he died, he left, his estate was worth 
as well as his copyrights uh, for the songs and the music that he'd been involved with, uh, it was £160,000. He didn't own any property. He had a nice left-hand drive Mercedes, quite, quite old at the time, and he had a bunch of really great suits, you know, from Tom Brown or whoever. I think anybody who's obsessed with money really attempts to they either go broke or whatever, or they, they t attempt to as ma amass as much as possible. I right. think one of the reasons for that, that he was quite insouciant about money, was that he came from quite a wealthy background and he was quite a spoiled child. In fact, it's in his kind of pathology, if you look at his background, uh, just briefly, his father left the family home when he was 22 months old. Right. Um, he didn't see his father again until he was 42. And his mother, one of the reasons his father left with his mother was what we should call flighty. Um, and um, his mother wasn't really interested in him or his uh, slightly older brother. Um, and so he was brought up by his grandmother, who was very indulgent. And so he had this dichotomy in his background, which is he was at once rejected and abandoned by his parents. And at the same time, spoiled and indulged by this grandmother. And I think with lesser people, it could have broken him. But in mm -hmm. fact, it was the spark that drove him forward and made him such a unique and unusual person. It's the, uh, the grandmother that is a really fascinating thread that pulls through this entire book uh, from his childhood to there's a, there's a chapter in your book called I'm a sex pistol baby. Oh yeah. <laughs> and uh, in that chapter, he says that his grandmother was the first sex pistol. Yeah. And uh, you know, later on in life towards the, there's a chapter called history is for pissing on and they're talking about the uh the the show shallow 120 right. and uh uh you say his grandmother would be proud of putting together this work where we find the uh the framing uh working with this format uh for a ribald theatrical occasionally uncomfortable but re relentlessly provocative sort of presentation yeah and so, uh, so, so who was this fascinating woman? Her name was uh, Rose uh, Corey Isaacs. Am I, That's right. I... She, was, she was born Rosa Corey, one, uh, one, uh, one twin. The four daughters. Was a diamond dealer who had uh, was a fodic juice who'd come up from the Iberian Peninsula through the diamond ateliers of um, Amsterdam to East London. And East London was really the locus for those people of the Jewish diaspora of the late 19th and early 20th century. Well, they arrived in, in town in 1860. Abraham was born and I think he tried out as a cigar maker for a while, but eventually uh, reverted to becoming this diamond uh, dealer in the East End of London, it's quite wealthy, uh, had a very nice place in this uh, part of town, Stoke Newington, uh, which was very Jewish. Um, and Rosa Curry was this very provocative young woman who wanted to tread the boards. She had theatrical ambitions. She was very interested in that ribald, there was a strain of British musical, what you would call variety, but it's really English musical, which is very ribald, it's coarse, it's funny, it's full of double entendres. We see it still. Benny Hill was kind of an, a vague echo of it, if you like, in the 70s. But this was quite cutting edge stuff and it was very much appreciated by the working classes because as usual in England, you know, there's this class friction that goes on. And it was a way of kind of, as we would say, taking the mickey out of the upper classes with songs such as Burlington Bertie about a tramp who believes that he owns Piccadilly. So um, she came from that background, but she was stifled in her ambitions by her father. And so she married a man she didn't like, a tailor called Mick Isaacs. And uh, they had one daughter who was um, McLaren's mother. Rose didn't like the daughter either. Uh, she sounds like a really difficult person, but she was super connected as well. She knew all the musical managers, she knew all the cinema ushers. Her 
great friend was Harold Pinter's mother. Um, and so when she kind of got hold of Malcolm McLaren at the age of 22 months, he had this long auburn ringleted hair. He'd obviously got that strain of Sephardic, you know, Portuguese. And she recognized that in him and she'd always claimed she was born to Portuguese aristocracy. And so she kind of realized her ambitions in a way, like a lot of parents do, but this was the grandparent, through him. She made him very confident as a young man, as a boy. He spent one day at school, looking at, lying under the desk, looking at the girls' knickers, was kicked out of school. And so she said, I'll homeschool you. And she gave him manuscripts of Dickens novels. It took a year to read Pride and Prejudice. She gave him these books uh, of the classics of English literature. And that was his schooling for a couple of years. So out of that, when he eventually goes into society and joins a school, is this very strange, confident troublemaker. And in a way, he was the living embodiment of Rose's ambitions for herself. Right, and that's kind of a, a repeating pattern you see throughout his life uh, in, in to lesser degrees, even in the way he kind of projected himself or his ideas with the Sex Pistols. Uh, you know, it's there, there's some heavy psychology going on there. And yeah, I mean, yeah, he's an absolute textbook case, isn't he? Lauren Hutton, his lover in the 80s, said that he had this psychology of a serial killer. I think that <laughs> she was joking in a way but eventually he did go into therapy, um, uh, which I, I think was much needed and I think changed him uh, for the better. But um, yeah, he, he adopted this very you know, camp, I think we would say camp persona, which was very driven at the same time, wherever he was. So, you know, he, after he left art school and he'd been to most of the best art schools and really applied himself. But after he left art school, he opened this shop, which was a 50s revivalism, British 50s revivalism shop called Let It Rock. You know, it's a celebration of the teddy boys, so your, your greasers, I guess. But right. they, these were peacock guys who went completely against the grain of that kind of post-hippie period in Chelsea. Within two months or three months, this was being covered in the national papers. You know, within a year or so, their clothes, uh, the clothes that he designed with his partner then, now Dame Vivian Westwood, their clothes were in major British films. So he had a student, he really applied himself to projects so that they were successful. So by the time he, he wanted to form a band and he gave them the name, the Sex Pistols and the rest of them, he'd already success, you know. Right. So, you know, talking about the Sex Pistols and sort of them approaching him. How much do you think the New York Dolls look influenced Sex Pistols? I think it, it did and it didn't. I mean, it, there, was a, there, was a, there was a great kind of freeing, liberating side to the New York Dolls look in that it came at the point of glam where glam was kind of glitter rock, as you would call it. But glam mm -hmm. here was kind of fizzling out. It was a short-lived thing that had been really embodied by such greats as Mark Boland with T-Rex and people like Roxy Music who were much bigger than that, but they, they were aligned with it. But the, um, the dolls didn't give a fuck about anything, did they? And so the way they looked, they wear little school, little girls' blouses with kids' holsters and, you know, that teased up hair. I think that that liberating way of approaching your look is certainly one of the ways in which we can see the liberated way in which punk rockers adapted their, their clothing. Interesting. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it, it, it's, it's a subject of much debate. Um, yeah, I mean, there's always this push and pull in pop culture, between Western pop culture, between the US and the UK. And, uh, you know, there is that element that in some ways British punk was a was a political it was politically infused because we have a class system which makes politics out of everything from the way you hold yourself to the way you talk to where you live I think that's less so in you know you have you have uh, different issues obviously but in a, a so-called meritocracy 
such as the US. I think punk was a less, to, to start with, it was a less political with a capital P movement right. than it was in the UK. Would you agree? Especially in New York City. Yeah, it was an artistic, romantic movement, wasn't it? Mm-hmm, very much so. Yeah. Well, let's talk a little bit about Malcolm's move to becoming a recording artist himself. Yeah. Uh, how, how was that uh, received upon arrival? Well, when the records were released, mm. I think with amazement because they were so good. Um, and also he was doing that thing which is now very good, you know, it's contemporary. It's been, it's been around since really dance culture exploded in, particularly in the UK in the mid to late 80s. You know, he was working with the producer Trevor Horn and the engineer Gary Langan. And they were, he was kind of the MC. You know, I was listening to an album by Tricky the other day and I was thinking, well, nobody complains because Maxine Kay's got a fantastic voice. Maxine, right. uh, uh, whatever. When any of the singers that he's using, you know that it's a Tricky record. I think that it was Tricky uh, for uh, McLaren because when he released his records, such as, you know, uh, the Dark Rock album first off and, and then Fans, which was R&B and opera, and you've got opera singers there, meshed with uh, street R&B from New York. People are kind of going, well, where's McLaren in this? You know, right. is he actually, and you know, of course he lived up to that as well. He said, oh, I just, you know, I'd, I'd get the people to put it together in the studio. Of course he didn't, he really worked at it. And he, you know, he was uh, over, overall, over everything else, he was a great conceptualist. And so the concepts were his. And so the fact that the Hilltoppers played the square dance on Duck for the Oyster, and then it was meshed with samples and you know scratching and stuff like that. It, it nonetheless, you know, it's McLaren's vision which is central to it. And I think it's taken us a long time to understand that, don't you think? Very much so. Um, I have been listening to Doug Rock uh, pretty regularly for the last couple of weeks. Uh, it's, as a I make it. it's a great album, isn't it? It's it's great. It really is. It's fascinating the way it's uh, put together, yeah, uh, you know, and I know in the book we talk, or you talk a little bit about William S. Burroughs being kind of his hero, and I, and I see some, some William S. Burroughs style coming through in there a little bit, just in the cut together. I, I, I sort of the chant the dream team and all these things kind of it, it's very surreal it it moves it moves like a dream and it has been every, like a, a minute does not go by where you don't hear a very recognizable sample from somewhere else right yeah <laughs> and you know it's the it's the surprising it's the surprise of those juxtapositions isn't it and mm -hmm. of course this is somebody who'd studied fine art and right. understood collage and juxtaposition it's interesting you mention um, Bill Burroughs because um, McLaren, when he was at Goldsmiths Art, Art School in South London, organised a free festival uh, in 1969. And on the poster, it's, it says that these people are invited or will take part, including William Burroughs and Jim Dion, the pop artist. Now, this geezer I spoke to yesterday from Mexico, who went to college and was there, said that he booked them through... Oh. Robert Fraser, the gallerist, later McLaren's friend. But they went to um, Robert Fraser at his gallery, Great Gallery in Duke Street, and he opened up his address book. And Jim Dine and William Burroughs did take part in a panel at that event. Oh. And this is 1969 when McLaren's 20, a 23 year old student. And he gets these really powerful cultural figures to travel down to Lewisham, which is a grotty part of town and take part in this mad hippie event. So there's another thing that comes through or came through for me in writing the book is there's a consistency. So people such as Burroughs and techniques such as his cut up, which he developed with Brian Geisen, as we know, mm -hmm. they're consistent throughout his work. And so his final films, I don't know whether you've seen them, but they're really beautiful collages. Um, they're cut ups, basically. 
the Sex Pistols can be viewed as a cut-up. The clothes that they wore, they took the brothel creepers from Teddy Boys, they took the baggy pants from what Johnny Rotten did from Zoot Suits, you know, they wore drapes, they wore rocker leathers. There was a bit of mod in there as well. There was some skinhead. This was a, really a collage. And so, and then later on uh, with Westwood, McLaren designed a suit called the William Burroughs suit. So, oh, I think, wow. so I think he had a set of key obsessions like a lot of us do when we're teenagers and slightly older, but he mm -hmm. kept the faith with them throughout his life. Interesting. It kind of makes it makes the safety pin symbolize something completely different <laughs> when you think of it in the in the in the cut up context like that. Yeah, you know? absolutely. I mean, I wrote a piece for a jewelry magazine a couple of years ago about the importance of the safety pin and talked to some leading jewelers. Um, and of course, he didn't bring the safety pin to the mix. I think it was probably John Lydon, Johnny Rotten, and or mm -hmm. Sidney who were using that sort of make to amends, you know, kind of showing process and all that stuff. We just unwitting it. They just did it because they knew it looked great. But in McLaren's hands, he realizes that this is a great part of the mix, you know, uh, that can really help tell the story. Right. That's that element of chance coming into play. They <laughs> always, always, you know, I think he loved the, the chance encounter. There was this technique that the situationists and Guy Debord, their leader, developed called the derive, the drift. And the idea of that is that one should wander around the uh, urban landscape and be repelled and attracted by whatever you find. And in a way, you're making an artistic statement. That sounds a bit highfalutin. But in fact, one of the central stories of McLaren's life is this story about when he got Vivian Westwood to make him a blue lame teddy boy suit. And he walked down the King's Road and got to the end and then had this encounter with somebody who said, hey, do you want to open up a, a little stall in the back of this shop? And so, you know, the chance event, the chance encounter was something that really attracted him because that meant that things didn't get too stale. Right, right. Uh, before we get too far away, uh, just to go back to, um, we were talking about Duck Rock a minute ago. Um, so, you know, you think of, of, you know, Peter Gabriel's Real World albums and Paul Simon's Graceland, uh, which are often kind of hailed as avatars of world thinking music into the pop spectrum right uh, but i feel like mclaren is a really overlooked character in that process it seems like he was he was doing this uh, uh long long before even with that uh, that influence was there. he grabbed onto it i think before anybody else did oh, certainly yeah i mean there is the story about he escapes uh, exiles himself in paris for six months after mm -hmm. the sex pistols break up in you know, fairly hideous circumstances and there are court cases going on and he just gets out of town and he gets a job working for an adult film company and they send him uh, to create soundtracks for their cheesy movies and they mm -hmm. send him to the Beauborg Library in the Centre Pompidou, uh, which is a really fantastic music library with great sections and rather than go for classical music or some dopey, cheesy, easy listening music, he gravitated to the ethnic section. And on one of these albums, which I mentioned in the book, he found this fantastic rhythm, the Burundi drummers rhythm. This right. fantastic track, which is a field recording from 1967 in really darkest Africa. And again, this chance thing, there's always some kind of sense, sense of humor and chance to his stories. And a lot of people really don't believe them because of this, but I believe it to be true that he fancied the uh, assistant, uh, the librarian, behind the desk and so he took the album over to her and said play track 11 play the last track on the second side and she put it on at 45 rpm rather than 33 and so this burundi beat is sped up and so it sounds like something that bo diddley would make if he was an african tribesman you know right. it sounds <laughs> totally tribal and really exciting and a light bulb goes off and over mclaren's head and says, I found a new rhythm for rock and roll. And so 
he kind of kept the faith with it when you know he introduced that rhythm to Adamant, who used it to great effect, and then to his band Bow Wow Wow. And then when he came to make his own album, he was very attracted to going to Africa and working with African musicians and not just staying in Johannesburg studios working with white musicians or even having black musicians obey the curfew. He went to Soweto and when the producer and engineer would go, all right, mate, we're, we're off, we're leaving you to it. He stayed there all night jamming with these guys, smoking weed, drinking some palm wine and just having a great time. It's the only way to do it. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> It's a you know, um, recommended way to make a hit record. <laughs> right. Um, so, uh, you know, you'd mentioned this a little bit earlier in the conversation, but um, see, he was, he was in the pursuit of authentic creativity a lot of the time. That, yeah. that phrase, authentic creativity, towards the end be almost became a mantra in, in a lot of his public speaking events where he would talk about sort of the need for authentic creativity versus karaoke culture. Yeah. Can, can we talk a little bit about what that means and, and what he was really saying? Yeah, well, I think that this was condensing some of his ideas in later life, which he'd always had, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, in a way, punk was authentic, you know. It was supposed to be the authentic voice of the dispossessed. Um, and, you know, it, it's arguable whether that was achieved or not. But I've worked with some fine artists, uh, an artist I worked with a few years ago, Derek Bosher, the British pop artist. And he told me that really uh, artists refine. It's a consistent, which is why, you know, Hockney is probably his greatest now in a way, because it's, and Derek probably is as well, because there is this consistency, which is all about refinement. And I think that that authenticity versus karaoke became an obsession in the last 12 years of his life. And it's no coincidence that it coincided with globalization. Right. And so he understood that the coming of coffee shops to London meant that independent small businesses, even our sandwich shops would be squeezed out by your you know, usual suspects. Uh, and so he, detected or he believed that Tony Blair, who was our Prime Minister from 1997, um, was a karaoke politician. Because really, Tony Blair had been in a when he was at a university. And he kind of didn't respect that. You know, he thought that was a karaoke way. I mean, look where we are now in terms of karaoke politicians, right? Sure. And so he's kind of, I think, predicting what's happened to us now. One of his friends, Peter Culshaw, who ran his mayoral campaign, which was all about that, actually, which is all about reintroducing craft and authentic authenticity to London, which is soon, which is really being swamped by big money. Um, he said that, you know, in a way, McLaren was reigning against the situation where we are now. We're all slaves to Google, Facebook, slash Instagram, you know, Amazon. These, these people have got a grip on us all over the world, you know, TikTok. And so this was McLaren's kind of last gasp attempt of the counterculture he'd been reared in to, you know, blows against the empire. That was what he was trying to strike. Right. That's, um, that's, that's, uh, yeah, it's, <laughs> he was, he was rallying for authenticity, but in a way predicting a culture that doesn't allow authenticity anymore. Yeah, I think he was a romantic. I think this is one of the aspects of him is that he was a terrible romantic. He was always proposing marriage to, you know, his various lovers. I mean, this is a great thing about him as well, which I think goes beyond the kind of one dimensional image is that throughout his life, he conducted lengthy relationships with very strong partners. Um, but yeah, he proposed marriage to, I think, three of them, as far as I know, one of whom, uh, Charlotte Skin Catling, is a lovely person, an architect. And she told me that, you know, she was really amazed by this kind of romantic gesture. And he said, I want to send your mother a letter asking for your hand in marriage. 
and he did but uh, his mo her mother was quite taken aback because he decorated the borders with flying cocks <laughs> <laughs> He had this kind of strange idea of romanticism, which was quite bawdy at the same time. Right. It goes back to that, that ribald. Yeah, you know. exactly. And, and also provocative, as, as you said about the grandmother, you know, constantly pulling the rug from under you. Don't get too cosy because, you know, something else is going to come along to upset the apple cart. Right. So, well, when you look back on the book and, and all of the stories and all the information and everything you you kind of processed to put it together. Is there an anecdote or a story or something that you think of that is, is really illuminates the character of Malcolm McLaren? Maybe um, more so than the others? I don't know, there's, there are so many. Um, I think the, the really touching thing for me uh, was the, when he was reunited with his father, which happened in 1989 when he was 42 years old. That came about because he was supposed to be promoting his album, Waltz Darling, which by the way, introduced voguing and the New York ballroom scene to the mainstream, you know, just right. as a side. But he, um, he'd been talking to Lauren Hutton a lot about his background. I mean, I think he was quite serious about reviewing what had happened to him as a younger child. He never really knew he'd heard all these myths and legends about his father's departure whether his father was alive, where he was. Um, and so he started, you know, asking interviewers who wanted to talk to him about Walt Starling, whether they would put in their paper that he's looking for his father. One of them did, and his father's partner rang uh, this journalist who then put him in touch with McLaren. Two days later, McLaren came face to face with the father who'd abandoned him that he hadn't seen for 42 years. Um, and they kind of got on. Um, he was an interesting cove, his father. Never left England, supposed to have emigrated to Australia, never left Britain, in fact. But um, about a week later, McLaren was in uh, Seville with his girlfriend, and he sent a postcard to his father, and it says, Dear Peter, that was his father's name, or Dad, I don't know what to call you. And it ends with this line from Shakespeare, uh, this is written from your son whose, uh, whose name is written on water. No, this is written from your lost and pagan son whose name is written on water. I mean, it's incredibly touching. And so there is this very vulnerable, exposed side to him, which even for me, and I, I didn't know him very well, was really, really Surprising. Of course, I'd always supposed that behind this there was, a, of course, a human being. But to see it written down is really remarkable to me. And I think it told me a lot about him. Yeah, when that the way that that is presented in the book, in its little standalone chapter, uh, where he finally comes face to face with his father and says he is who he says he is. Yes, uh, it's a very yeah. haunting moment. It's a very powerful moment. I think so, you know, because the father was an interesting bloke, as I say, and um, about cut to 10 years later, the father had been diagnosed, I think, with leukemia, and he dictated some notes to his wife, Barbara, who was very kind in giving me access to them. And there's this interesting view of the father, of McLaren, the public figure, and also his son. Um, and he's trying to square um, but he talks about how insecure McLaren is, and he's quite um, quite clinical about him in a way. Um, and so that whole episode, which I reconstructed there, was really based on both of their testimony from both sides. And I thought it merited really putting it at the beginning of the book, because in a way, for me, this was his rosebud. You know, you can't understand McLaren unless you understand the loss that he went through with his father's departure and the psychological impact it had upon him. And then also there is some kind of conclusion to it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it, it's a very beautiful uh, part, of, part of understanding who he is. You mentioned that, you know, just the, the fact that it humanized him in a way that uh, nothing else really ever had before, at least in the, in the public image. 
Um, you know, and, and a lot of, I think a lot of the public image is based on the sort of interaction that went on between uh, Malcolm and, and Johnny Rotten, or John Lydon after the Sex Pistols. Mm -hmm. is, you, there, there's a level of, um, what's the word? Uh, s snark? Yeah. <laughs> the, 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 I mean, the, both of these characters are masters of, of, of that, of just sort of taking each other down very quickly and <laughs> very uh, precisely. Um, yeah. So, so, you know, to see this whole other element of Malcolm McLaren was really kind of one of my favorite things about the book. Well, thank you very much. I was very keen to, not to produce a hagiography. I mean, I hope that I presented, you know, uh, a fully rounded portrait for him because, you know, he could be, I mean, none, of, none of us is perfect, right? And he uh, right. could be mercurial and he could be cruel and cold. But I knew that, I knew that there was this side to him. I mean, personally, he was always incredibly generous to me and I'm not alone in that. Many, many people, including lots of the people I interviewed, you know, one of the first things they'd say, if we'd not met before, they'd say, look, I hope you're not just going to go down that route again because that's not the man I know. Um, and for sure, some people were burned by the experience of uh, coming close to him. But I think directly or indirectly, a lot of us benefited from our association because I think it set us off on, you know, various paths. You know, the day he died, the news of his death came through in London. I was, I happened to be with a group of people, including Mick Jones of The Clash. And oh, Mick wow. Jones' life was completely changed by going into the shop that was called Sex that he ran with Vivian Westwood, where it was this kind of proto-punk fetishist environment, which was very provocative. And so Mick was saying, you know, this is such a shame because we'll never hear his ideas again. You know, and that's really, that really struck home to me. Not because it was Mick Jones saying it, it's because, you know, it's such a good take on the loss that I thought we should recognize. And really maybe if you ask me about the origins of the book, it probably goes back to that. That, that moment. Yeah, probably, but one of them one of them yeah well that's a that's a very uh, that's a very poignant place i think where we can stop and uh open it up to some questions from the viewers uh let's see i've got a few of them here and um i'll just go ahead and start this one is from laura hunt and she says mclaren is alleged to have carried her in a copy of du Bois society of spectacle in his pocket. Can you comment on the influence of Henry McLaren, particularly as it pertains to his work with the Sex Pistols? I, I think he was totally infused by it. Uh, this uh, college friend that I spoke to um, just yesterday was telling me that he believes that McLaren had already come under their sway in 1966. I thought it was a bit later, but still, you know, so as a very young man, as a 20 year old, and I think it stayed with him, particularly their techniques. I mentioned the derive, which is, you know, setting yourself up for the chance encounter and the experience beyond your ken by just opening yourself up to it. And then, you know, there's the detournement as well, which is the practice of juxtaposing banal images in this case, maybe with political thoughts you know so you get a, a teenage romance panel strip with political slogans in it um, and so I think that if you look at the Sex Pistols through that prism you can really see and I know that some of those guys really bristle at this they say you know we weren't situationists it, there wasn't a grand scheme but I think that McLaren opened that situation as it were up to those kind of explosive outcomes. And I think without his input, the Sex Pistols would have been a great rock and roll band, but they wouldn't have had that edge that his interest in situationism brought to it. Very nice. So the next question is from Julian. It says, fascinating that Malcolm's association with Robert Fraser seems to have begun in 1969. This possibly adds credence to the background of the Cambridge Brian Epstein t-shirt design, doesn't it? 
A fantastic book, by the way. Thank you. Oh, thank you very much. That's, uh, that's very kind of you. Yeah, I mean, um, he, um, like many students, actually, um, uh, he went to Robert Fraser's gallery for the private views and so the chance to rub shoulders with these greats who were only really being shown in this tiny gallery. In fact, you know, there is not, it occurs to me now that Robert Fraser's gallery in the 60s was rather like what he, what McLaren set up at 430 Kings Road in the 70s, in the, it was the locus for a lot of creative exchanges. Um, and McLaren really, really admired Fraser, not least because by the 70s, um, he'd become a bit of a broken down angel as a result of, of course, the court case over, and the jail sentence over his involvement in the Redlands, Keith Richards, Rolling Stones, Keith Richards uh, bust, drug bust uh, in 67. But I think that made him all the more interesting to McLaren, the fact that he'd now been neglected by the great and the good. Uh, but Fraser was still full of very interesting ideas and takes on things. And let's remember that in the 80s, as ill as he was, he was the first to really show people like Keith Herring and Jean-Michel Basquiat in London at that time. And so I think they saw in each other similarities. That uh, There's a great book uh, by Harriet Viner about Robert Fraser called Groovy Bob, which was his nickname. And McLaren's in there towards the end saying that, you know, he really loved him because he opened up a world of possibilities. And I think maybe there's, a there's some of that with McLaren as well. The possibilities were, were more open by coming into contact with him. Right, right. Okay, so last question. And that is, uh, this, this event tonight is taking place in Atlanta, Georgia, at least on my side. Mm -hmm. And uh, this is the city where the Sex Pistols played their very first gig on American soil. Right. And so there's a rich history here. Um, but it, in, in Atlanta at the time, was kind of an unexpected place for the group to play, but kicking off their tour in the American South versus somewhere like New York was part of McLaren's plan. Um, can we talk about why he booked them here and that instinct that he had to put the Sex Pistols in sort of unorthodox or unexpected places? Yeah, well, I think it's that thing about, you know, making them free radicals and so that they upset the process. And the idea wasn't to play in front of hipsters in New York or even LA you know the idea was to take this music to it again it's a part of the authentic isn't it to give access to this music to everyday people on a world tour starting in America and then I think they were off to Finland after, you know, within 24 hours of the final gig uh, in San Francisco, a couple of weeks after the Atlanta gig, which opened that tour. Um, and so this was part of a grand plan, which was probably far too ambitious, particularly given the state of Sid Vicious by this point. But it, the idea was the grand plan to play around the world and end up in Russia, I think, at one point. Um, so that was the idea, was to upset the expectations of the music industry because, you know, it's a much overused word, the, the disruptor. But McLaren and John Lydon was fully in agreement, by the way, as well. He thought that this was a great idea, that they should disrupt the music business expectations by not playing to those hipster crowds, because then you become part of the scene. And McLaren certainly never wanted to be part of any scene. He wanted to be, you know, the leader. <laughs> It's uh yeah that's that it's it's fascinating to look back at the way it was covered. Um, all of those New York journalists came to Atlanta for the first time. Exactly. Um, <laughs> yeah. you, well, it, got it, out, it got them out of their comfort zone as well, didn't it? Very much so. Yeah. <laughs> so all right. Well, uh, we can go ahead and wrap it up there. Okay. Uh, it's been a great great talk. I really yeah, appreciate it. Yeah, thanks, Chad. Yeah, thank you very much. Thanks and, for having me. Okay. And if anybody needs the book, uh, head over to acapellabooks.com and you can pick it up there. Again, Paul Gorman, thank you very much. Well, thanks to you, Chad, and uh, I hope people who watched really enjoyed it. I certainly did. Yeah, I had a great time. All right, then. Bye. All right. Thank you. Bye.
Bye.